Good afternoon. I'm so happy that you all have had a chance to join us today. We already have 40 people um, waiting in the wings for this awesome discussion. Um, I'm very thrilled, as you can tell, to moderate this panel on what it means to serve our Latinx communities in higher ed. And we're so lucky that we have um, a scholar who works in this area, uh, Chancellor Patrick Valdez, uh, who will be sharing uh, some of his excellent information and um, just motivating and inspiring us. And um, our powerful panel includes another chancellor, Alice Letney. And so welcome, we're so happy that you're here today. And other really important individuals that I can't count as people, go-to people, you know, to help me understand better what it means to serve in this context, including our Vice President Cheo Torres, who we're very happy to see, and also Rosa Isela uh, Cervantes, who uh, I've said this several times, she is, and the work that she does is really the reason that I'm here at UNM because her students and their earnestness and um, just, uh, I guess, their enthusiasm I found to be so infectious when I came for a campus visit um, a year and a half ago. And so Rosa, thank you so much for your good work. And I also uh, want to recognize my friend Lorena Blanco Silva, who has put this panel together and has held it down at DEI for a decade now. And so we're very appreciative of her um, really crucial efforts, along with Frankie Flores, who's in the background today. That's not Frankie's normal space to be, but um, just wanting to recognize and appreciate you as well. And so we'll turn it over to Lorena for our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Dr. Zarai. Founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial, have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations, and also acknowledge our committed relationships to indigenous peoples we gratefully recognize our history. And then the presenters for today's webinar are um, Rosa Isela Cervantes, Dr. Alice Letney, Dr. Cheryl Torres, and Dr. Patrick Valdez. And I'm gonna do a real quick brief bios on everybody. Um, Rosa Isela Cervantes has a master's degree in family studies and a bachelor's degree in sociology and Spanish from the University of New, of New Mexico. She's a strong, strong advocate for students and has worked in education for over 18 years. She currently serves as director of El Centro de la Raza, the premier institution devoted to the empowerment, transformation and development of underrepresented migrant and Latin, Latino students at UNM. Over the years, she has served in various leadership capacities in state and national associations and served as the program operations director of the outreach initiatives for UNM's College Enrichment and Outreach programs, the CEOP programs, where she's involved in TRIO and OME programs. The focus of CEOP was to serve first generation low income and underrepresented students. She is special advisor to the president on Latino affairs and serves as principal investigator for the high school equivalency program and the college assistance migrant program, serving students from migrant and seasonal farm working backgrounds. Dr. Alice Letney is the Chancellor of UNM Valencia. She has a bachelor's degree in, from Reed College and a master's and PhD from the University of Connecticut. She has served as Chancellor and other titles prior to being Chancellor were Executive Director and CEO of the University of New Mexico Valencia campus since 1995. She has nearly 50 years of experience working in two-year colleges and she served as the New Mexico Associate of the president of the New Mexico Association of Community Colleges in 2000 to 2001 and 2005 to 2006. Having served at UNM Valencia campus since 1995, 
She has led the charge to educate not only incoming freshmen, but those currently in the workforce by bringing industry recognized initiatives to continue or elevate their education. She's currently undergoing final approvals at the state level. One of the signature, her signature achievements has been her leadership in bringing forward the Workforce Training Center project on the west side of Los Lunas. In addition, over the past 20 years, she has led the campus in the award of seven HSI Title V and two Title III grants, as well as the first TRIO SSSP grant awarded to a UNM branch in 2001. Dr. Cheo Torres has served as Vice President for Student Affairs at UNM since January 2nd, 1996. Before coming to UNM, he served as Vice President for External Affairs at Texas A&M Kingsville, and he also served in the bilingual doctoral program at Texas A&M at the University of Kingsville. He has served as Interim President, Vice President for Student Affairs and Special Services, Director of the University Center for Continued Education, and also as an Assistant to the President. For two years preceding his appointment to AM University Kingsville, he was with the Texas Education Agency in Austin, Texas. Among other initiatives, Dr. Torres has been involved as an Institute for Mexicans Abroad Advisor to Mexican Presidents Vicente Fox and Felipe Calderon for improving lives of immigrants in the United States. He also teaches the traditional medicine without borders curanderismo course in the Southwest and Mexico class during the summer semesters of U at UNM. He's published four books on this topic, and the popular summer class has also been turned into an online course available during spring and fall semesters and as a four-part free online course through Coursera. Dr. Patrick Valdez is an accomplished higher education executive with over 20 years experience in developing and executing ex academic and student success programs. He's the chancellor and professor, he's the current chancellor and is a professor of education at the University of New Mexico Taos. He has held senior level positions at the, at the College of Mount St. Vincent in New York City, the University of Texas at San Antonio, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, and, and CUNY Lehman College, developing and executing academic and student success programs, and is a recipient of the Rocca Merit Fellowship from the Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education at the University of Michigan. He has conducted research and practice on the challenges and obstacles facing first-generation college students, given presentations on executive leadership, African-American faculty experience at Tier 1 universities, increasing the number of underrepresented students in STEM, and bridging the gap between higher education and the community. His current research focuses on the policy formation of Hispanic serving institutions, legislation, and the role that HSIs will play in educating the na nation's fastest growing student population. He's a graduate of St. Edwards University with a bachelor's degree in international studies, a master's degree in student personnel administration from Teachers College, Columbia University, and a doctorate in higher ed administration from the University of Texas at Austin. And we give a warm welcome to our panelists. So I'm going to jump right in with some questions. And again, thanks everyone for being here today. And so question one starts with a statement. The University of New Mexico has been a long standing um, federal designee as an HSI. And so now your two part question, how has your campus benefited from its HSI status? And also, please share ways you've been able to institutionalize and build capacity. And so, uh, Dr. Valdez, would you like to start us off? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zariah. I was actually going to defer to the to the to the, the people who have been doing this a little bit longer than I had, but um, I'm happy to start. Uh, and first, let me just say thank you uh, for and DEI for for hosting uh, this conversation today. And, Lorena, um, thank you for, for that kind introduction and so, so great to be on this panel, uh, our, our panelists is, uh, on this discussion today. And when we think about Hispanic serving, you know, I think of the word serving and uh, it's, it's how we serve students. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I think recognizing uh, where we have also received uh, the service of others. And, and so with that, I'd like to say uh, how much I have benefited from uh, 
uh, learning from Dr. Cheo Torres, who's been a, a colleague and mentor for a very long time. So it's uh, especially an honor to be uh, on this conversation with him today. And then, uh, of course, Alice Lutney, who's just been a strong, strong supporter of the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities over the years and for uh, HSIs and, and also serving now as her colleague, but long before that, also a uh, someone that I looked up to. So I want to I thank both of them for, for what they've meant in my life and, and where I'm at now. So uh, again, thank you. But, you know, we've um, at UNM Taos, if I can, I'm going to share my screen here. I just have a, a few slides to show um, that will help, you know, uh, show how we've benefited. But, you know, we're a, a small uh, community college up in rural New Mexico and in Taos and our student demographics. And I know that this may be somewhat distorted and I apologize for that, but uh, just to, to serve as a, as a border player that you know, our student demographics, over 50% over of our students are Hispanic. And uh, that mirrors pretty much what the population of the, the county is in, in house area. So we're representative of, of, of that. Down here, you probably can't read this, but in terms of capacity building you know, for the grants that we've received uh, over the last five years, Title V grants, we have a uh, um, uh, what we call the the Cumbres grant, which is a, a communities uniting to model and build rural entrepreneurship success. We've got a, get, a guided pathways to success, a GPS grant that we've had. We've got a, what we call the Unidos grant, and then we've got what we call the Caminos grant. So all of our grants have you know some some uh, there's an acronym, but typically is a from a, from a Spanish name that I have. You know, Caminos mean of course roads and highways, however you want to interpret that, Unidos mean that we are united, and then there's the, the guided pathways. We've been able to hire about 17 staff from eight faculty off of the grants that we've received through Title V. We've obviously been able to uh, upscale our technology in our classrooms and throughout our campus. Uh, we've done professional development through HAKU and ASI uh, and uh, AHI, and this basically means that we're able to, to support our staff going to these conferences so that they can receive professional development around best practices and serving Hispanic students. Uh, focus on pedi 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 excuse me, pedagogy and curricular changes. I think that also kind of gets at the heart of, of serving and we can probably talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we have student publications that uh, this past year focused on equity. So not just for HSIs or Hispanics, but in terms of the much broader equity that, uh, of our campus and the multi-racial uh, campus that we have. And then we've developed a touch point team uh, for social and emotional support. Uh, we know that social and, social and emotional intelligence are important. And so we try to be aware of that and make sure that we, we reach out to our students specifically during this pandemic where most of them are taking courses remotely. And, and so we need to be high touch with those students. And then the last thing I'll share is that um, is the O'Neill's grant that we were a part of was a, a, a collaboration or I'd say a three part uh, a grant with two other institutions, Adams State College and uh, Colorado and Alamosa, and also uh, uh, Highlands, New Mexico Highlands, which is just uh, about 50, 60 miles uh, east of us on the other side of the mountain. And this was a grant where we were, uh, we sent faculty and staff every summer to uh, a week long training on equity uh, that was written into this grant. And so this is this three part collaboration between these institutions. And in the final year of that grant, uh, they actually required that the administrative team, so the chancellors and the presidents of these institutions participate in this equity training for this past summer, uh, or say last summer rather. Um, you know, I attended this equity training as well. And really what it was about was developing equity-minded practices uh, that would help serve uh, our students. And because this was, um, so all of our students, but specifically, you know, because these were Title V grants focusing on Hispanic students and some of the challenges that they face, this this um, one of the outcomes of that grant was this mural that you see here um, that I'm showing. And this is uh, on our art building and it is uh, actually recognized a, a mural in our town. So people come to visit Taos, they can come see this. It's, it's, it's a public campus. But this is a way for us to show how we celebrate um, our diversity on our campus and also recognize the uh, the area in which we stand, the land in which we sit, which is Pueblo land. And so it's just kind of real celebration of, 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 of community and equity. And this was put together by comments that our students submitted. You know, we did it, we asked them what they thought a mural should represent. And then we had a local artist, Amy Cordova, actually draw up the, the, uh, the mural. And then we had Jenny uh, uh, Ustick, who's a, a, a world-renowned muralist, come and actually put the art on, on this wall. And then all of us, 
uh, and we invited faculty, staff, and students to pick up a paintbrush over the course of a week and paint in a, a portion of it. And so I, I'm responsible for just a small part of it. Uh, but these are the things that we've done, you know, curricularly, uh, social emotional intelligence, uh, and also in terms of the just general temperament of our campus, right, the ethos of a campus to celebrate diversity, which our Hispanics make a portion of that up. And so anyways, just wanted to uh, take a minute to show uh, what we've done with some of the monies. This is not comprehensive, you know, we don't have that much time, but certainly wanted to share those things. So thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to hear about the social and emotional intelligence aspect of the work that you're doing. Um, I know that when students come to us and they have a list of demands and, you know, they want that want everything now and yesterday. And, you know, it's really helpful to explain to them the way that institutions work and that the way that people work, you know, if you want to go to your mom and ask her for something, you don't demand it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you do your chores and then you come and politely ask, you know, and so, you know, teaching our students again, how these institutions work and really it's better to work with us, you know, to help them meet their needs as opposed to just always making demands, you know, that's an important skill that they'll have the rest of their lives. So thank you for that good work. Thank you. All right. And so next we would like to invite Dr. Cheo Torres to respond to the questions. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, Dr. Sarai uh, and uh, well, Vice President Sarai, should I say, and uh, Director um, Lorena Blanco Silva uh, for organizing today's event. But I also want to recognize Patrick Valdez. I met Patrick Valdez, uh, Dr. Valdez, when he was working in Haku. And, and Lorena also was working in Haku, serving Hispanic serving institutions, uh, more than 400 from around the US and, and abroad in different countries. So uh, they have contributed a lot to HSIs throughout the world actually. Now, how have uh, we institutionalized some of these projects that we started, uh, say 50 years ago? The first one that I can think of is this college enrichment program, SEP, that serves it's, it's university funded and state funded and serves first generation low income students. Um, we also institutionalize three ethnic centers. You'll hear from one of them today at Centro de la Raza, Rosa Isela Cervantes is the director of that center, but we also have an African American Student Service Center and American Indian Student Service Center, three ethnic centers that we have institutionalized. Uh, recently, we institutionalized um, a, a mentoring institute it serves the whole university. And they do an annual uh, international conference on mentoring. Uh, we also have institutionalized a lot of STEM um, programs with, with emphasis in, in science, technology, and engineering uh, that because of uh, some grants that we receive being an HSI. So this university uh, has taken institutionalization very seriously uh, because when you receive grants, federal grants especially, they expect you to institutionalize those grants. Many agencies don't do that, but this university has done that for several years. So I'm really proud of the University of New Mexico that has taken a lot of the grants seriously and has institutionalized many of these grants. And that's basically what I have to say. Thank you so much. We appreciate that, Dr. Torres. And so next, we'd like to go to Chancellor Alice Lutney. Thank you, Asata. I'm so glad to be here. And we can't go any further without um, remembering that Cheo um, was uh, inducted into the Hall of Champions at Haku. He's one of the, you know, he will be there forever um, uh, as, a, as a leader of Hispanic serving um, initiatives. If we did not have HSI grants, our innovation would not have happened. The, the majority of innovation we've done is because of the federal money coming in. And you might notice that uh, during my bio, we said we had one number of, um, of Title V grants, and then there's another number that, that, we're, that I'm talking about. The very first Title III grant was actually 
um, it was actually um, administered under Title V. So one can argue we either had six Title V grants since 1999 and three, and three Title III grants, or seven Title V grants since 1999 and two Title III grants. But they all have been critical to us. The, it was amazing to us that we were able basically to start our development office and our grants and contracts office with our very first Title V grant. We started a scholarship endowment. And you know, it's not a lot of money. We do about 50,000 for each grant, but we now have and I remember, we're a little tiny institution. You know, our enrollment is roughly about 2,100 headcount um, um, uh, each semester. But we now have a $2.2 million um, uh, scholarship endowment. We worked really hard, partly because our previous, one of our early uh, deans on campus, Ronaldo Garcia, uh, really thought that it was important for us to invest in technology. So because of his leadership at the time, we got an enormous amount of technology, video capture, and then in later years, we worked really hard to do online. And that has helped us tremendously through this um, COVID um, pandemic because we were already kind of set up, almost every faculty member, full-time faculty member knew how to do, teach online. It was really wonderful. So can we go to the next slide, Lorena? Okay. So the latest, um, and by the way, we try to institutionalize everything that we get. You can't institutionalize everything because basically you're doing pilot projects. Some don't work out, some do. But our latest grant, we're following in Patrick's footsteps, where our latest grant is to create a guided pathway project, which will help both our transfer students and our students who are going to graduate from us reduce the number of credits they're taking by intensive advising, working with both faculty and, um, and advisors to do that. Um, and we want to do stopped out students. We have a lot of stopped out students. Our campus is over 60% Hispanic, um, which by the way, is roughly the same percentage in our county and our service region. But stopped out students are really hard because our students are often place bound. They have families, um, they work. For them to come to college is an amazing experience to begin with. So the other thing we've done is create a resource hub in our latest Title V. And that will offer the students assistance with anything that they need that we can get from other agencies in the area. Um, and one of the projects we're going to work on is financial planning. We did a financial literacy program in the Title III program that will end next year. It has been very successful. Uh, we're using texting to get to students to advise them about their financial situation, and that has worked great. So we are extremely grateful for everything we have gotten through um, Hispanic Serving Institution grants, and we are thrilled that last year, um, the Title III grants were made um, permanent. And I was um, honored uh, to speak at the press conference at the Capitol literally a few hours before that was passed. And the president signed it. And we're really happy because that's for all minority institutions for STEM and that program should go on forever. So thank you, Asata. That is my presentation. Thank you so much. We appreciate that, Chancellor Letney. And now we turn to Rosa Cervantes. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you all the panelists and uh, the Division of Equity and Inclusion for partnering in this initiative. Um, I think it's really important to understand that as a university, we don't directly get funds because we're a Hispanic serving institution. 
but rather we have to submit proposals to get those funds, right? And so it's because we're an HSI that we qualify to apply for those grants. And I think that's a distinguish, distinction that we have to make uh, because I think folks are under the impression that uh, UNM as an HSI just automatically gets a pot of money that gets sent to us because we're an HSI. I think it's important to, to recognize the difference is that all of the initiatives that um, uh, Dr. Torres, Litney, and Valdez just talked about is really because of people on the ground uh, putting in the hours and hours to write the grants uh, to, to then implement them at the institution. And I, I say that's important because um, it's not something that you just do in your regular day, right? You have to put some extra time and effort into it. So I've had the privilege of being a part of several Title V grants um, since the very first Title V uh, grant that I remember uh, uh, with Dr. Tim Gutierrez and Dr. Um, Jennifer Gomez Chavez, as they were the leaders in that grant on our campus. Um, and I think those were possible because we had programs like El Centro, like um, the Enlaste program and other initiatives across campus that really um, highlighted the fact that we were committed as an institution to a Latino and Hispanic students, uh, but recognizing that we had a lot more to do, right? That there was work that needed to be done to be able to serve that, the community in a way that actually helped our students graduate, right? Transition into UNM, stay at UNM and then eventually complete their journeys and hopefully move on to graduate school as well, right? Whether that meant that they came to main campus via our branch campuses or transfer from other places or straight in from high school, right? And so I think what's important to notice is the things that we have been able to institutionalize um, at UNM aren't necessarily seen with the eye. And I say that because there's system changes that have taken place. For example, um, with the gateway, the STEM gateway um, Title V grant, that really institutionalized and changed how science and math courses were being taught at the university to really look at how students of color should um, or learn, right? So that we could keep that in mind. Uh, we've instituted pe uh, peer learning facilitators to really help students in the classroom to help understand content, right? Or even just to, to understand where you go to navigate the system if you're a first-gen student, for example, which many of our Latinos are, right? Um, there was a lot of workshops and programs and work um, events that took place that we still continue on today, right? Um, and then, of course, some changes in the way that we keep data and, in, um, and talk about impact. Uh, we weren't very high in, in when it came to data, for example, in the student services areas or student affairs, and we now do a much better job of collecting that data. So um, our current grant, and so then we have that, uh, the STEM, the Title V, the STEM Gateway, STEM um, uh, Up program. And then we also then had the STEM Collaborative, which really worked at redesigning um, curriculum across the STEM fields, right? And trying to change that a little bit. And then uh, currently the eCure, um, I always have to look up what eCure stands for because I can never remember it but it's a grant through the NSF um, and it's really to help with undergraduate um, education. And so none of these specifically spoke to the fact that they must be geared towards Hispanic students. However, it was to change the system, keeping in mind that Latino students were in the system and we needed to change that. And by mere fact of that, it also changed the system for all students in ways that hopefully help uplift all the communities. And I think it's important to note that um, El Centro, again, uh, Dr. Torres talked about this, and El Centro La Raza is one of those uh, programs that, um, you know, has been here for 50 years, uh, created by students, actually, uh, Professor, um, I just lost his name, I forgot his name, it'll come to me, Felipe Gonzalez, um, he's an emeritus professor now and works with um, Advance. Um, he, you know, wrote the initial proposal when he was a student. Um, uh, for the program. And so just recognizing that it, it starts with people putting in the, the work. And yeah, it's challenging. Uh, I do want to say, you know, I appreciate our, our students who are continue to fight and continue to request to change the system to better meet their needs. And so, you know, we just recently saw a group of biology students come together to really propose um, 
actual changes and things that we could do differently, right? Starting with an, an academic department, but really moving into what does that mean campus-wide? Um, so those are a few things, right? There's a whole lot more. And I think like uh, Dr. Rodriguez said, we have so little time to talk about so many different subjects, but that's to highlight a few things um, that we can start with. Father, if I could add to that, I think that there's a, a few things uh, in regards to the Title V that I think Rosa mentioned and, and that all the presenters have mentioned that are important. And, and one is that, yeah, we, we have to qualify, for, you know, we have to apply for these grants and then get selected. So it's, it's, a comp, it's a competitive grant process. So to keep in mind that sometimes the institutions that are most in need of these grants don't have the capacity to actually write the grants or to have the resources to actually put together a grant. So we have to keep that in mind. The other is that because of that, right, it doesn't, it doesn't preclude all students from benefiting from a Title V. So in the case of um, a computer lab that is built on campus as a result of Title V, that, everybody has access to that lab, not just Hispanic students, right? But the institution, because of its commitment to serving Hispanic students, is awarded these grants, right? And so everybody benefits uh, from that grant. And I think that that's an important distinction to make. The other thing is that not only when you think about institutionalizing programs and services, that's at, at the top of our list for those that work, as, as Dr. Lutney mentioned, if, you know, if, it's a, if it's a piloted program and we don't get any benefit, you know, you know, let's not do it. But if it does work, how do we keep doing it? But also the technology that we get as a result of these Title V grants. I, I, I know Alice, because we've had this conversation, you know, we're able to buy hotspots and give out computer software during this pandemic as a result of those Title V grants. Had we not had them, there'd be a good number of our students that wouldn't be able to be taking remote classes right now because we weren't able to give them those, that technology. But when they're on the campus, we have state-of-the-art classes, uh, smart boards, and those are a result of, of uh, programs that uh, or rather technology that is institutionalized, right? Because it's, it stays on and, and for, for years uh, to come. And so that's uh, important, I think, to mention. And then the last thing I'll say is that this Title V, the importance of it is that it's also created these other uh, programs in other uh, institutions of, uh, of the federal government. So for example, we also have an NSF HSI program grant that was in large part influenced because of these Title V monies. We've got a USDA NEFA grant that is in large part influenced because of Title V. So there are a lot of other uh, programs and institutes that are part of the federal government that now recognize that they should be doing programs that focus on underrepresented students, and in this case, Hispanic students. So I think that those are all benefits of the Title V that we're all uh, gonna benefit from. And may I say that Patrick is absolutely right, because if you think about it, the NSF grants that he's talking about, they were fought for by Haku for years and finally, finally um, came out. And it is a wonderful thing that although these grants are targeted towards Hispanics, uh, Hispanic students, they are for all of our students. So it, it is, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. Thank you so much. That's actually a wonderful, um tie into the next question, which is about the impact of these federal funds on our Latinx students. And if we would have been able to see, see the same successes, if it weren't for the 24 million, which is amazing, Alice, uh, that you all have um, been able to be awarded uh, at Valencia and the TRIO federal programs um, that El Centro has been involved with. And so, um, Rosa, would you like to start us off with this? Sure. Um, and actually, um, El Centro isn't directly involved with the TRIO programs in the way that I used to be before. Um, they actually are housed out of the College Enrichment Outreach Program under the leadership of Andrew Gonzalez. Um, I did serve as the PI for Upward Bound and EOC for many years and had the opportunity to write several of those grants and still partner with all of the TRIO programs and what's important to mention about the TRIO programs and then the, the grants that we do get at El Centro, which is out of the Office of Migrant Education, which is the College Assistant Migrant Program, CAMP, and also um, HEC, the High School Coolancy Program. All of these programs are federal funds, right? Federal programs uh, that really serve students who are first generation from underrepresented groups, uh, from a specific working background, um, to really improve their journey um, from high school to college 
and into graduate school. And so what's important about all of these grants and the way that these programs really support, for example, the work that we do at El Centro is that it provides opportunities for students that might not otherwise have come to UNM, right? They might not have otherwise have gone to college period across the nation, um, but then also support them in ways that the institution still needs to work on as an institution, right? Which is to really meet students where they're at. So we have students that come in with various um, ACT, SAT scores and um, various GPAs um, have various challenges of, of economics, right? Being able to, to choose between paying your tuition or putting food on the table, right? And so all of these things, all of these programs really work together to help us better serve our students. Without those funds, so many students would not have the amazing journey that they do have, right? Regardless of those challenges. Um, and I think that's what's important to note is that we have students that um, really stay involved because of their TRIO or OME um, connection. And so we work really hard to have the type of handoffs to each other, right, as professionals, as familia, to connect students from one person to the next, depending on where they are in that journey. And I think it's super important. So while we don't get money to, for example, fund through HEP and CAMP, the the base of El Centro, right? We then are able to serve in camp 30 incoming freshmen who come from a migrant or seasonal farm working background and provide them with scholarship dollars and intensive advisement um, and intensive programming that they can receive in conjunction with the camp program and then their their connection with El Centro, right? And then we have to connect them to student success um, services or um, you know, uh, McNair, all of the other programs. Thank you so much. Um, Chancellor Letney, did you want to say a little bit more about this? Y yes, it, I think a trio is very important. We have had Upward Bound for several years. We received the first trio grant from any to any branch campus um, in 2001. Um, and we lost our TRIO SSSP grant, and it's kind of interesting how we lost it. The TRIO students were doing better than our regular students, so you can't have that. So fortunately, we've written the latest grant, we'll do the TRIO, and TRIO has made such a difference on our campus in terms of piloting the way that they tutor and having a lead tutor who goes to a class and then can work with the students in a group, it's a wonderful program. So we're very, very grateful for all the programs that are available to us. We couldn't do the work we do without these programs from the federal government. Absolutely, and the research really shows that that type of intensive mentoring and specialized instruction is helpful to all of our students. I know at UNM main campus that our, uh, many of our student athletes are outperforming our other students, again, because they're getting that individualized attention. Uh, Dr. Valdez, there is a question about the SSS uh, uh, or triple S uh, at Howard. <laughs> sure, well, again, to just uh, echo everything that Alice and, and Rosa said, you know, in terms of the, the support services that, that they provide to our students, couldn't do it without those grants. We also have a trio, uh, uh, sad to hear about Alice's trio. Uh, fortuitously, we were uh, refunded uh, for our trio this, this past summer. We received notice, so we're excited to have that program continue. That helps our students once they're, they're in. Uh, already no, we got it back, Patrick. We got it okay. back this year. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, 1.6 million, five years. Congratulations, awesome. So, you know, these are important grants, couldn't, couldn't hire the faculty and, and in some cases with some of these grants um, that we've had, we couldn't hire uh, staff to support those students uh, anywhere from you know, enroll, helping them get enrolled to financial aid information to the tutoring that's uh, important during persistence. We also have a Veterans Upward Bound grant. We're the only one in the state that has it. Uh, that's not specific to enrolling students at UNM Taos. We can serve any veteran in the state of New Mexico, but it's basically a way to help uh, uh, veterans transition from military service back into civilian life. And so we're proud of that VUB grant. We also have an upward bound math and science uh, grant uh, that we have, program that we have that we serve, you know, anywhere from 
50 to 60 students a year. And I don't want to say that this summer, our uh, the program uh, director for that, I think we had something like maybe 40 students that were engaged remotely, high school students that were engaged remotely in that program. And so those are, are some of the, the SSS grants that we've received. And again, there was a question, could we do uh, service? We would do service the best that we could without them, but we certainly wouldn't have the reach that we have uh, if we didn't have them. Thank you so much. Dr. Torres, did you want to respond to the question? Yes, I'd like to concentrate on research because you mentioned that, Dr. Zarai. 24 years ago when I came to the University of New Mexico, there were a few Hispanics doing research, but because of the research opportunity grant that we got from the state, and then later on the McNair program from the federal government, uh, we were able to change that. Now you see a lot of Hispanic students and other minority students going into research. And just recently, two years ago, we started a FIRE program, first year research program for freshman students. The University of New Mexico is noted as a high, very high research university, uh, tier one research university. So research is important. I'm beginning to see more uh, Hispanic students getting their master's and going on for their doctorate degree and coming back to the university to teach here or to teach at other universities. So uh, I'm so pleased that, uh, uh, that, that because of these grants, our students are doing more research than any other time. That's beautiful. And we know that to answer the essential questions of humanity, that we do need a broader array of individuals to come bringing their unique perspectives so that we can begin to answer those questions. And so to the extent that that is, or broadening participation in research, um, you know, we, humanity has a chance. So thank you so much for- And uh, Asada, you should know that our, our latest Title III grant, which will be ending next year, has an undergraduate research component. We could never have done undergraduate research for our students and prepare them for a four-year institution without the Title III grant. It's, it's a wonderful program. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think it'll be important to note that because we have so many students, um, I think you know we haven't even talked about the percentage of, of Hispano and Latino students at UNM, right? But we have 44% of students um, identify as Hispanic, Chicano, Latino, and we have uh, we have to talk about all of the opportunities that we still need to figure out how to provide. Um, and Centro also does uh, El Puente Research Fellowship uh, for that same reason, because as Dr. Torres said, we have many more students interested in research uh, and interested in and recognizing that they can do research, right? That they, they do fit at the institution and that there is ways for them to research the things that interest them. Um, so we do the same at El Centro. Um, and then we have other programs that continue to, to do that work and, and provide as many opportunities for students as possible. And so just important to note. Absolutely. Uh, we know that with the eCure grant that we have currently, that developing that science identity is really an important um, precursor to students really considering um, doctoral degrees and you know going after that, high, that education at even the higher level. Um, and we know in the humanities and other fields that aren't science, that again, that research mentality and growing that is really important. So thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, there's a question in the chat that I wanna pose to you all. Can you each talk about the involvement of Latino students in research at both the undergrad and graduate levels and is there a discrepancy in involvement there? So whoever would like to jump in on that. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, the reason, the real reason that we started our undergraduate program is because, um, it's because we had a student who went to Tech, New Mexico Tech, and she couldn't she, she wasn't prepared to do lab reports. She wasn't prepared to do presentations. And so um, it really was, it really sparked the, our sense that we better prepare these students. So that's why we did undergraduate research. And these students have been presenting 
at various undergraduate uh, programs in other states uh, presenting their research and at UNM main campus. And uh, again, the majority of these students are Hispanic because our student body is 60% Hispanic. So thank you for that question, Frank. Oops, sorry. That's a great question, if you don't mind if I jump in on that. Oh, I think it's important um, to also mention that research is happening across campus in all fields of study, right? So there's some great work that Chicano and Chicana Studies is doing, um, especially now that they're also a PhD program, uh, but they have students as majors, right, as undergraduate and then graduate degrees, both MA and PhD. And so they're doing some great research there on topics that, you know, um, I don't think we would have talked about in research uh, 20, 40 years ago, right? And so it's important to make those distinctions. And so there's a lot of students doing research both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, Dr. Torres mentioned FIRE through uh, the College Enrichment Program, right? A freshman initiative. We often see many of those students go through a centro talking about um, through the El Puente Research Fellowship where we really teach them the basics of like, what is a um, research question really look like? Um, how do you do a literature review? Um, and then just talking about also having the ability to be your whole self in that research and that you don't have to give a part of that up and so that you can research things within your own community doing it the right way. Not that you're researching them, but that you're researching yourself, right? And so there's ways to ask questions and to be part of the community and to get involvement and really think about um, the kind of work that you want to impact and the, the kinds of things you want to change in the world. So I think that's what's really great, uh, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Last year, we had a, a student working on water rights um, in the College of Engineering. Um, we had students working on sexuality, on you know, uh, law enforcement, so many different things. And so it's important, there is still a lot more work that needs to be done. There's so many more students that need that kind of support that they get in a cohort program like McNair or El Puente. But, so we need more programs like that. We need more funding to make that happen. Absolutely. And so we are about to run out of time. So I'm gonna jump in with one of our favorite questions about what it means to be Hispanic enrolling versus Hispanic serving. And I know that uh, Dr. Valdez is poised to um, provide a response. Well, thank you for the question. And, you know, I think that the most important thing, I, I think that one of the questions that we had uh, talked about before was, you know, is there a difference between Hispanic rolling and Hispanic serving? And I want to say, yes, <laughs> there is. I mean, there are some institutions that are, are Hispanic enrolling, uh, not Hispanic uh, serving. And, and, and so the question is, you know, what does that mean? And I think that you know, to borrow from, from you know, Gina Garcia, who, Dr. Garcia, who does a lot of research on, on HSIs, uh, you know, this idea that servitude, you know, how do we serve our Hispanic students or all students, but in this case, Hispanic students, and that that starts with having an understanding of these racial inequities and racial injustices that have occurred, you know, contextually um, around us, right? That a lot of our students uh, have experienced growing up. And so then when they come into a college campus, you know, is it more about them coming to our campus to be part of a recruitment effort or is it really about climate and making sure that we're changing climates as well? And so a lot of these Title V grants, I would say that it starts off by making sure that your staff and your faculty and your administrators in many cases understand why they are recipients of that Title V grant because you're an HSI, because it's a designation and not because a designation that the federal government cited unilaterally one day that would be good uh, but because Latino uh, advocates uh, in the 70s started pushing Congress to uh, provide more money to institutions that were serving Latino students. And so there's this real history that, that exists around the HSI designation that the majority of people who work at HSIs and even the students aren't aware of. But before you can create that identity of servitude, we have to create this you know, awareness. And once we can create this awareness, uh, then we create this understanding and then that understanding then comes to uh, identity. So an example of, of, say, serving, right, and servitude is we've talked about programs uh, and how we serve our students. But at the same time, how do we uh, look at pedagogies in our classrooms that also support uh, Hispanic students and students of color, right? So that, that the attitude sometimes of an instructor or a faculty member saying, hey, well, it's the responsibility of the student to do more, uh, having that faculty member look in the mirror and go, okay, what can I do more to make sure that I'm doing things in the classroom that will uh, help this student engage the curriculum, right? So the idea that 
that if a student is sitting in your classroom in silence, uh, they're telling you something. And the attitude before used to be like, well, it's their problem, you know, uh, not mine. And now uh, using some of these Title Five monies to do professional development and workshops or on faculty training that say, hey, how do we engage these students uh, so that they will uh, persist in our classrooms? And now you tie that to hey, these grants that provide not only support for faculty in some cases, like, like we've had on our, on our campus, but also now blend into uh, math tutoring, uh, math labs, which tie into this question of research that was just brought up, right? So there's, there's grad and undergrad research, and then there's undergrad research and then undergrad community college pathway to that. And so at the community college level, you know, having faculty that really understand the challenges that are underrepresented, that our Hispanic students are facing outside of the classroom is very important. So it's not only about social and emotional intelligence that our students have to have, it's a social and emotional intelligence that our faculty and our administrators and our staff have to have. And so that, in the interest of time, will say, I would say comes from the top. From the, top. You know, the leadership has to be aware. Uh, and I think this is why it's important that there's growing research around HSIs and the impact that HSIs and Title V grants and the SSS grants are having on underrepresented students so that this hopefully motivates more and more universities and administrators to be aware of the impact of these grants and the success of these students that really benefits the institution, uh, not just the student, right? So we can commoditize education and think like, well, the student benefits. Well, not only the student, the college benefits because more and more higher education is under scrutiny to show what its outcomes are. And so if you think about being an HSI and serving, not just enrolling, um, and you put all those things together, then not only does the institution and the student stand to benefit, but the nation itself. And so that's the, the way that I would encourage all uh, leaders of higher education institutions from top to bottom, because not, you know, not presidents and the chancellor are not the only leaders. Everybody's a leader in their own way, um, that all of us kind of come together and, and understand that, and then that can help push us forward. And, and, and you know, we can receive the outcomes that these grants were intended uh, and that the framers uh, hoped that they would accomplish. Bravo, Patrick. Yes, <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, one of the most insightful people I know, Professor Kirsten Buick, talks about the fact that diversity should change us. You know, it's not about bringing diverse bodies into a space and we change them. No, it's about us all changing and that's really where true innovation comes from, to be changed. And so, um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Well, the work, the work is hard, too. I mean, I think that that's something that you, you mentioned earlier about the social emotional intelligence of our students and having them understand some of the, the challenges and getting them to, to work with us. And, and I think that that's something that administrators uh, and faculty and staff have to understand as well, that none of this is easy. Uh, you know, this is why the federal government has made some of these investments, and this is why uh, really, uh, most of us, you know, that are working in these institutions that are advocates for these these monies uh, are doing it. And, and so none of us should be um, under the impression that, you know, you get a grant and it's an easy thing to do. You know, we, we ran our GPS grant, um, which supported faculty and all these student support services that I'm talking about, expired uh, last year. And we do have three more Title V grants that we've been able to, to, um, to, to um, be awarded. But specifically what that GPS grant did was some of the things I've already mentioned. Well, we institutionalized those things because they were important. So we said, hey, we're going to keep those math faculty on. We're going to keep on these tutors. We're going to keep in this math lab. So, so I think that there's an awareness around it. Uh, has to be the start of it. And, uh, and it's, it's not easy work. And we have to remind ourselves of that daily. Thank you so much. You're right. It is definitely not easy. Uh, Lorena's uh, fond of saying if it were easy, everyone would do it. <laughs> so you know, here's but it's not easy for our students either, though. And I think that that's oh, a good thing. To, you know, that, that's a thing to remember. Yeah, they have to pay the tax. It, is, it isn't hard, easy for them at all. So this will probably be our last question. And it's two parts that aren't completely related. So stick with me here. So part one, how has the presence of Latinos from outside New Mexico, including international students, shaped our identity as an HSI? And then the second question is, uh, is there a commitment by HSI institutes to hire um, persons of color staff? And so you could either answer both or part of one or the other. And who would like to jump in? 
I, I, I can address some of the international and students that we have on their campus. Uh, we have been blessed because we're in HSI. Um, not too long ago, the president, the CEO of HACU, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, invited me to do a presentation at the invitation of the American Embassy in Costa Rica. We went to an organization called AUPRICA that includes all of presidents from private universities, universities from throughout Central America. Um, and we met with them. We talked about the opportunities uh, that HACU offers and also that UNM offers international students. A year later, we signed an agreement with AUPRICA, uh, a UNM agreement with them. And because of that agreement, the School of Nursing has had several students from Costa Rica. We're uh, CELAC on campus, Center for English Language and American Culture is working with El Salvador on some programs. So we're opening the doors uh, for student exchange in uh, both exchanges from Central America to U UNM and, and from UNM to Central America. And we're talking about all the countries from Central America from Guatemala all the way to Panama. So uh, we did the same thing in Mexico with ANUIAS, another association of, of universities from throughout Mexico. Uh, so I think we're beginning to see an influx of, of, of students from other countries, Latin American countries especially, come to UNM and vice versa. The only problem is that uh, our, unfortunately our, our administration at the national level has stopped some of these exchanges. Uh, it could be because of COVID, it could be for other reasons, but I think the future looks bright uh, uh, to have more exchanging from exchanges from um, uh, international uh, countries, especially from Latin America, uh, both ways, not only break, come into UNM, but also from UNM to all those, all those countries. Thank you so much. I know that uh, Chancellor Valdez has a slide to share. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I answered the POC too, because I think that that's important. I mean, I, mean, I think it's important to understand that, that HSIs are not monolithic. So if this, this term is new to you, if this designation, I'd ask you to do some research. Designation is 25% or more, 50% low income, um, that uh, if an institution serves those types of Hispanic students, qualify for these monies, qualify. And, but not, you know, some are going to be 90%, some are going to be along the borders, you know, of, of the Southwest, some of them are going to be up in New York City. I mean, they're all over. And so it's hard to say blanketly that all of us are committed. Uh, so I think that in some ways the idea would be, yes, we're all committed to making sure that we're finding uh, faculty um, that represent our student bodies, but that that's probably not a, I can't say that all HSIs are committed to that. In fact, I think that's why we have the whole question of enrolling versus serving. Uh, I don't know, Alice probably has something to say on that, but if you'll permit me, Alice, I just wanted to share one more thing, uh, if I could, um, in regards to what, well, maybe not that. In, uh, can you see that? Um, mm -hmm. So right here. So this is something that we're proud of. So the voice, Cheo talked about the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, which is the lead advocacy group for HSIs. We were uh, pro two of our programs that, that uh, out of Title V that support our students um, and were highlighted this summer. Uh, it's called one was called Reaching the Summit, and one was called Into the Classroom. And again, this was focused on you know making sure you know from from entry to exit that our students are getting the support that they needed. And one was specifically focused on the natural resources and up in our area, a lot of our students want to work uh, outside uh, with forest. And so uh, these programs help highlight those areas. And so um, just wanted to, to share that with, with the community that, that joined us because we're real proud of that. Um, but a lot of this starts uh, with making sure that our students have the basic supports that they need at the community college level. And so we're proud to serve that role. And, and Asada, for, for our campus, our international students or non-English speaking students would come to us through our adult basic education program, which is critical to us, which is funded with some federal, some state funds. And that really does bring a richness to our campus that goes beyond our Hispanic um, uh, student population. So we're very happy to have the adult basic education program going. I hope we can get this pandemic over with at some point because that program really suffers when you have to try to do that remotely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, we are at one o'clock. I want to just give us another minute to see if we have any other questions come through the chat. I don't think that I see. 
Dr. Mm -hmm. Saray, I think yes, the question please, comes yes, to you about leadership. Please. And I think it's important. Um, the question was about how do we, um, through our leadership, ensure that the programs we work with and that um, the institution, you know, mirrors the community that we're serving. And I think it's really important to note that um, I've heard all of the individuals on, as panelists here with me today at one point or another speak up about this in some sort of forum, right? Whether it be um, at, you know, the Hill and talking to legislators and really talking about the national landscape to local communities at every table that we sit um, I know that sometimes I get the eye rolling of like, oh my God, here goes Rosa again. She's going to talk about what are we doing for Hispanic students, right? But that's my job is to advocate. Um, and more than a job, it's my passion because it's who I am, right? As a Nuevo Mexicana, as a Mexican American who's proud to, to be where I'm at because of institutions like UNM that um, have opened the doors and recognize that we need to do a lot more work, right? That there's things that we still have to do better um, that there's things that we need to improve so that Latino and Hispanic students are graduating at the same rate that they're enrolling. And so I think as leaders, um, you know, we, we work on that every day. And some days it takes students reminding us and other colleagues to remind us that we need to keep doing that work and that it's okay um, to sound like a broken record and to try different things, right? So trying to figure that out, I think is important um, that we continue to recognize the privilege that we have um, sitting where we sit and to be able to make the changes to the systems um, so that they do benefit more students. And while my work is really to focus on the Latino Hispanic students, my role is to really work for all students, right? Because we, we need to think about the future uh, generations. Um, I stand on the shoulders of giants and I know many more coming after me are going to be doing the same. And so uh, my job is to continue to open the doors and to provide the support um, and continue to make the system work for our students. Thank you so much. And so I'll just ask if everyone can just say final words and then we will close this out. Um, Cheo, would you like to start us off? Oops, you're on mute. Uh, Soraya, let me thank you and Lorena for organizing today's event and uh, to thank the participants uh, for being great listeners and for their wonderful chats. So thank you. Thank you. Chancellor Valdez. Yes, I just want to thank everybody who joined us. Hope you, you learned a little bit uh, more about HSI and what we're doing to make sure that we, uh, we hold true to that designation. Uh, it's not uh, the question about leadership. I couldn't agree with Rosa more. It's, it's, it's a tough, um, for those of us who have committed our lives to increasing access and equity, uh, it's, a, it's a labor of love. Uh, and sometimes, you know, things don't happen fast enough. You know, students are, all, are faced with structures. Leadership is also faced with structures. I mean, there are policies and, and systems in place that, um, that we also face every day that get in the way of us serving students the way we like. Uh, we work hard to, to try and um, mitigate those as, as much as possible. And the last bit I would have, uh, the advice I would have out there for, for those that are tuning in that are looking at moving forward and, is that, you know, where you work matters. You know, I've been very fortuitous in my career that I've been able to choose institutions that I believe were in line with what I believed in, in terms of service to the community and service to our students. Uh, I said there's over 400 types of HSIs out there, 400 institutions that are HSIs. Uh, if you're interested in working on HSI, I'd say look at their mission and visions and their histories and see if you can find one that really aligns uh, with what you believe in. It's not to say that you shouldn't go somewhere and try to change things but uh, you should just uh, make sure that you're educated in, in, in that area. So again, thank you all for, for tuning in and hopefully we help educate you a little bit. Thank you so much. Chancellor Letney. Well, I just wanna say that we should look at the positive as well as the challenges. And if you look at four-year graduation rates, Hispanic students are doing better every year. So we can see the results of the leadership which, by the way, is at every level, every level of our institution needs to have that leadership and that concern for students to make them successful. So thank you and thank Lorena for, get, for getting us together and thank you panelists. Thank you. And, and Rosa, you get to have the final word. Thank you. Well, first of all, again, thank you, Dr. Saray and Lorena, uh, Frankie for, um, holding us here together right in the space and, and 
facilitating that to my fellow panelists. I appreciate your knowledge and your hard work over so many years, and I thank you for being a role model for me. Um, you know, I think Dr. Lidney's right. We've got to focus on some positives and really celebrate those more. Um, meanwhile, we do the work to um, take down the barriers, right, and to deconstruct the challenges, to figure out how uh, to continue to meet students where they're at. And then I think it's important just to say, you know, this is hard work and it's okay. We're going to have bad days. Um, we're going to have good days. Let's celebrate those good days um, and keep doing the hard work. And then I just, I open it up to, to, to tell others that we all have to be in this struggle together. Like we have to work together to make things happen. It's not the easiest, right? Partnership is hard and partnership and trying to get everybody to have their voices heard and their opinions matter is hard work. And I think that's important, so because um, our Latino Hispanic students are so diverse, they come in every race, every econ social economic background, educational experience, uh, learning ability, immigration status, et cetera. And so it's so important to recognize and remember that when we're doing this work, we're doing the work for people, right? And we got to keep people centered. We got to keep students centered. And so I'm excited to be a part of this conversation and look forward to many more. Thank you. And Lorena will close us up. Thanks again to everybody, all our panelists, and for always answering the phone when I call you and <laughs> being willing to show up. So I, I definitely appreciate that. And um, I just wanted to add to Rosa's point about opportunities and leadership. I think that's something that we're all always pushing for. Um, one of the things that I think I'm most proud of with my work, my former work with Haku and my work now with the Division for Equity and Inclusion is that we are talking about leadership opportunities for all the different communities. I know we have a very um, concerted effort to diversify faculty. We're talking about implicit bias in hiring all the way across the board. And I think that really is gonna go a long way in helping not only the student body but more, be more reflective of our community, but also our professoriate and our administration, because that is going to be critical. So I'm definitely um, proud that of the work that all of all of you are doing, and I mean, and the the leadership that each university has, thanks to you. So thanks again for joining us today, and for for like I said, answering the phone when I call and being willing to to break this down a little bit. I think people hear the term HSI sometimes and they really don't understand the breadth of what it, what it captures, right? That it, all the different opportunities that it has provided and not only for Latino communities because we really all I think prescribe to that theory that a rising tide lifts all the boats, right? And so we're definitely hoping that we're all gonna make UNM you know, and our state better because of the work that all of us are doing. So thank you so much. All right. Well, everyone have a good rest of your afternoon and we look forward to seeing you next time. Yes. Gracias.